I'd say do another one. Okay. I have ten o'clock. I'm not sure. Yeah, let, let's let's do another verse of something. Okay. Just you may need to remind people in the sanctuary to be heard. The only microphone that's live out is the snowball. They, they have to either speak up or use the uh, microphone out there. Yep. I will do that. Actually, we could, uh, Marianne, would you go and give me a sound check on the microphone in the aisle, please? Just count or something. <laughs> keep doing, keep going. Keep, no, no, keep going. Uh, a, B, C. <laughs> now stand, stand up and just count to 10. Right, right, just, just right like that. Just, yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, Okay, are we ready? Yeah. Can those who are hear me okay? The speakers are all right? Okay, I don't get a lot of feedback of myself up here, so. All right, good. Well, welcome to our Orville Mennonite uh, Sunday morning worship. We're gathered as we have been for a year today. Uh, I think it was a year ago today was the last time we were only in person. Um, the, uh, and today we are a little more than a third in person and a little more than a half, I, though I don't have a screen in fr fr front of me, a little more than a half of us are online. Uh, it's great to see the folks who are able and, uh, and willing to be here today. And it's great to have the folks with us who are able and willing to be here, uh, virtually uh, and we are i'll remind us that we are still all gathered together none of that has changed our experience of it has changed but god's experience of it has not changed uh, we still are gathered before god with god together all of us uh, to worship and to support and to and to hear and to be encouraged uh, and uh, and to offer god praise and worship so that's why we gather this morning. Let's do that. And uh, Jan and Raleigh will lead us uh, from their home uh, in the lighting of our lamps. We light one lamp because we are part of a larger gathering of Mennonite churches working together for peace. And we are all part of a larger, diverse, worldwide Christian family. We light one lamp because we walk with our brothers and sisters of Upanga Mennonite Church in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. We light, we light one lamp because we stand with our sisters and brothers who are immigrants among us. We light one lamp to lament division and discord, brokenness, racism, violence, injustice, we light one lamp for hope, hope for justice, healing, wholeness, and peace. Let's pray together. Merciful God, help us to hear your messengers, your prophets, who ask us to repent and live the way of your salvation. 
Give us grace to heed their warnings, forsake our sins, and walk in your ways. Help us to trust you so we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, let's sing together. Uh, I'll invite those in person to stand. Actually, I'll invite everybody to stand. Uh, and we're going to sing number 112 in the Sing of the Journey, I Owe My Lord a Morning Song. Missy reminds me today that this is probably not the hymn, the, the hymn tune that many of us think of when we, when we think of this song. Uh, it's a little different. So uh, just, just a warning as we, as we start singing together. same book number 16 praise with joy the world's creator Age or nation dare divide, 
celebrate the Spirit's treasure, foolishness none dare deride. Praise the Maker, Christ the Spirit, one God in community, calling Christians to embody oneness and this the world shall see reflected, God is one and one in three. Amen. Let's be seated. Marilyn Camp will now read to us uh, the beginning of Exodus chapter 1. Or maybe it's the whole chapter. It'll be... I will be reading from Exodus 1, 1 to 22. These are the names of the Israelites who came to Egypt with Jacob along with their households, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Azur. The total number of Jacob's family was 70. Joseph was already in Egypt. Eventually, Joseph, his brothers, and everyone in this generation died. But the Israelites were fertile and became populous. They multiplied and grew dramatically, filling the whole land. Now a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, the Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on. Let's get smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put foremen of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithon and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread, so much so that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made their lives miserable with hard labor, making mortar and bricks, doing field work, and by forcing them to do all kinds of other cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Shipra and Pua. When you, when you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. And if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives and said to them, why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? The two midwives said to Pharaoh, because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women, they're much stronger and give birth before their midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well, and the people kept on multiplying and became very strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all his people, throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile River, but you can let all the girls live. So did they hear it or not? I've been thinking about this message for uh, a little more than a month and been kind of excited about it from the standpoint of Egypt. <laughs> um, I've been thinking for a long time about how important the, the events that happened in Egypt for the people of God, how important that is for the overall story. And so that's, that's what we're going to look at today. Um, so let's first talk about being foreign. How many people, how many people live where you were raised or near enough? How many people have, 
had the experience of living in a place for more than a week or three in a, pla- in a place where you did not grow up or in which your family is not rooted. For Allison and I, we've been transplants really wherever we have gone. Neither one of us live in our, in our hometown. Uh, I probably have two hometowns um, if we were really to look at it. Uh, Orville actually is the place where we've lived the longest. Uh, by far for me, um, uh, I've lived in Orville longer than I have in my, in the town I call my hometown. Um, and we're starting to feel like we belong. In fact, we were walking through the cemetery as we do a lot, uh, because it's an easy place for us to go and walk and they, and they do a nice job of plowing the paths. Uh, the, uh, uh, and talked about buying plots there. Uh, because we feel like we belong here. There is something different when a person is not from here. Uh, I, think, I think not being from here is a good experience to have. Uh, I, would, I would assume that it's probably also a good experience to live in the same town your whole life. I don't know. I've never done that. In fact, it, it baffles me a little bit. I have no idea what that's like. Uh, but my observation is that, is that living for a while, at least as a transplant, is helpful for learning about hospitality and, and learning about walking with people. It's not, that's not the only way to do it, but it, it does give that as a benefit. When I, when I moved away from New England, white collar hometown mo- to mostly rural Ohio, I had to learn a different pace of life. I had to learn different social cues. I had to learn different understandings, different ways of thinking. And this is a good thing. It's made me a better person. All right. So this is the third Sunday of Lent. Our five plus church group is looking at immigration passages in the Bible um, because uh, we saw that studies show that very few people claiming uh, uh, Christian faith or evangelical Christian faith get their opinions about immigration from scripture. And so we want to make sure we're not those people. We want to get our, our cues from scripture. We've had a number of opportunities these last few weeks to engage in what the Bible says about immigration. Uh, This is the third sermon, and there have been six devotions each week and three Zoom gatherings that we've already had with our five church community. One of the observations in the biblical story, at least in the Old Testament, is that the passages speaking about the posture God wants God's people to have toward immigrants, foreigners, strangers, refugees, aliens, Uh, is based in the experience of the people of God in Egypt. I should probably clarify that I suppose there is a sense we could say that these passages don't talk about the act of immigration. They talk about the posture God is telling the people of God to have toward those who are immigrants. Okay, so it's not really commenting on the political scene of immigration. It's commenting on the posture that God wants God's people to have toward those who are immigrants. Today, we're going to look at what happened in Egypt. Uh, The title of the sermon is It's All About Egypt, because there's a strong thread in the biblical story, including in Jesus, that is anchored not in the promised land, but in Egypt. Before we start, let's uh, remind ourselves how we bring what we see today in this passage forward to us. And I already gave you the cue for that. And that is that we are looking at passages that talk about the posture that God wants God's people to have toward immigrants. And so that is the very first immigrants, foreigners, aliens, strangers, other, right? We translate the words in the old, uh, in the old, Testament in different ways, and those, I'm using all those pretty much synonymously. Okay, um, so we bring this forward, looking at what God tells the people of God to have as postures toward those who are immigrants, uh, strangers, and so it. So before we jump right to this is what our government has to do, or this is what our government that we can get there after we talk about our own posture. And in fact, I would say that, that when God says, I want you to, I want you to have this posture, then as believers, as followers, uh, we should have that posture, whether or not our government has that posture. And so that brings up 
That brings up other opportunities and options later, uh, but first let's talk about uh, our own selves. So what about Egypt? I'm gonna do a quick review. This is a like throw it against the wall kind of a review of the biblical story regarding Egypt. Kind of start in Genesis 37 and read forward to Exodus I don't know, 20 maybe, <laughs> uh, certainly through 15, um, to get a big piece of this with the story of Joseph and then the story of Moses and the, and the, the flow through that. But then it jumps forward uh, later on into prophecy. There's, there's things said about Egypt and there's interplay that Egypt has with, the, with sort of the government of Israel. And then later Jesus himself is a refugee in Israel with his parents because Herod, uh, the, king, the Roman king of Palestine, wanted, wanted him killed. And so he and his parents were uh, told by an angel to go to Egypt and hang out there for a while. And it appears that maybe, you know, 10, 11, 12 years perhaps he was, he was in Egypt. Um, so uh, what happens is Joseph, son of Jacob, who is the you know, son of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham is the one, Abraham and Sarah were called out by God to begin this people of God, a specific people in the world, called out to learn the ways of God and then to show the rest of the world what it is that God wants and who God is, right? Uh, and so that thread, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, he annoys his brothers. Uh, who are already jealous of how much their father seems to favor him, and they sell him to a group of travelers and uh, who sell him in turn to Egypt into slavery, and he ends up being a slave in Egypt. And there's a long story in there filled with very interesting things. Uh, Gen again, Genesis 37 through 50, the chapters. Uh, but Joseph ends up as assistant to Pharaoh. He ends up pretty much running Egypt uh, as Pharaoh's right hand. Uh, he does well in his duties. He organizes Egypt to prepare for a famine. Uh, and in the famine, Jacob's other sons, uh, Joseph's brothers, are sent to Egypt to look for food because the famine also is, is affecting them up in the land of Canaan, where we would think of Palestine. They encounter Joseph and they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them and Joseph chooses to work at forgiveness rather than restitution. Through his leadership and because of his choice to trust God and forgive his brothers, Joseph's whole family, about 70 is what we, what we heard in Exodus there, about, about 70 in all with all the women and children, servants and everybody, uh, move to as Refugees move to uh, Egypt. And they are given, they negotiate with Pharaoh, and they are given the land uh, of Goshen to live in, and they are to be shepherds. They are sh shepherds, they have flocks. Egypt, the Egyptian folk don't, don't really like to do that kind of work, but they do like to eat meat, so they were pretty happy to, uh, they were pretty happy to let the, the, the Israelites take care of their flocks. And so it was, a, it was a good relationship. So from 70 people all the way to the Exodus where Moses takes the people out, uh, the people of Israel grow from 70 people to maybe a million, 600,000-ish men, right? And so, you know, you add others in. And so a lot of people, I mean, that's huge growth, right? And about 40-ish years prior to that exodus, uh, this is what happens. You know, the people, the people you know, over, over years and years, people grew and grew and grew. The Israelites filled up the whole land that they were living in. And then a different pharaoh took charge, a different king. And this king, it says, what, what was read in the, beginning, in the beginning of Exodus there, the king didn't know Joseph. Now we should do a side note here, right? The, the phrase didn't know probably means more like didn't respect, didn't care. It does not seem to mean that didn't know who Joseph was, never heard of him. I mean, there is history there. Joseph saved the people of Egypt from death and the famine. Like, and Egyptians took history. I mean, they took notes on the history stuff. Uh, and so like the king would have known the history. 
Uh, but what he didn't know, he didn't know Joseph personally. He didn't have any relationship with Joseph, Joseph's people. And even more, he didn't respect or didn't care. So the new king saw the Israelites in all of their many numbers and said, oh no, these people are a threat. He didn't say, oh, look at these nice friends. They're taking care of our shepherds. We've had good relationships for a long time, many generations. No, what he did as, and the king here, you know, in monarchy in that sense, right? This is the Egyptian government, such as it is, was pretty much the king. Uh, he chose to act out of fear toward this people who had had generations of historically good relationships and helpful relationships and give and take out of lack of respect for Joseph and history. And he moved on Israel and did two things to subdue the Israelites. He killed the firstborn baby boys and he put the people into slavery. In this context, we hear Deuteronomy 10, 19, you must love immigrants because you are immigrants in Egypt. Back to the king of Egypt deciding to act in fear. Moses was born in this time, in the time of the killing of the boys. Uh, but he escaped the killing, right? And in a parallel story, really, to the story of Joseph, uh, Moses grows up and grows up in power in Egypt and eventually leads the people out of slavery. And that's making a very long story this, this big. And there's a lot that happens in there. Slavery in Egypt begins with the killing of the firstborn sons of Israel, and it ends with the saving of the people of Israel, blood on their door frames, angel of death passing over, and the supernatural killing of the firstborn sons of Egypt. In this context, we hear Deuteronomy 10:19 saying, you must love immigrants because you are immigrants in Egypt. The overall biblical story into which we are grafted, meaning this is also our history. It's not our physical history, right, in terms of bloodline, but it is our history because we are grafted in, we are adopted in as followers of Christ. We are adopted into this chosen people. And so this story is our story. And so we look at what is said to this people, because you were immigrants in Egypt, then you must, and he outlines throughout the Old Testament, a number of good behaviors, inclusion, acceptance, kindness, normal amounts of justice, treating the same as anybody else. And throughout the Old Testament, God is referred to often as the God who led the people out of Egypt. Do this because I'm the one that led you out of Egypt. Remember, I led you out of Egypt. It's a defining moment for the people of God. And from this defining larger event and then the more defining moment of the Passover, we get the definition of salvation. Salvation in the New Testament makes absolutely no sense without the story of slavery and release in Egypt. From, from slavery to freedom by an action of God. The Passover produces communion in the Lord's Supper. And throughout the Old Testament, especially the posture of the people of God is given as kindness, compassion, inclusion for not just immigrant stranger, that's our topic for today, but also widow, orphan, poor, and others. I would also say that nowhere in any of the passages that we've looked at, if you've tracked all, all of them in the Lenten re readings, nowhere does it indicate that the people of God, the, the people who are in and established, should choose whether someone is an immigrant or not. All of that is someone, a stranger who chooses to live with you, a stranger who wants to be a part of who you are. That's the language. It's not set up gates and set up checkpoints and set up all of this stuff. It doesn't do any of that. Remember, we're talking about the people of God, not governments here, right? For, for us, at least, right? So uh, it's always the, the person on the outside who chooses to be a part of you 
treat them as you would yourselves. We continue to hear, include immigrants who want to in who you are because of your experience in Egypt. It's all about Egypt. Obviously, it's not all about Egypt, right? But Egypt plays a powerful part of who we are and who God wants us to be. There are echoes of Deuteronomy 10, 19, which was part of our passage for last week, and it's part of a, a time in Deuteronomy where, Mo, well, the whole book really is Moses saying, hey, remember everybody, this is who we are. Remember all this because you're about to go into the promised land finally. All right? Deuteronomy 10, 19, there are echoes of that coming forward into the New Testament. Maybe the most direct, a parallel more than an echo, in Acts chapters 10 and 11 when Peter uh, and then after Peter, the Jerusalem council learned to welcome Gentiles into the faith. Read that story, Acts 10 and 11, uh, uh, and see how that happens. Another, another is more of an echo. It's, 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 it, it's more of an echo uh, than a parallel, right? It's a similarity. We say it in the Lord's Prayer. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. God says, because I have forgiven you, I want you to be forgiving. I want you to forgive others. It's even related to Jesus' law summary, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This is all very consistent. And Jesus says, this is, this is where all the law, this is where all the instructions hang. They hang on these two things, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And we know this is related because the follow-up question to this statement by Jesus is answered, I mean, the follow-up question is, well, who is my neighbor, right? Uh, and it's answered by Jesus telling a story of an outsider doing the right thing for a hurting person and held up as an example of righteousness. To summarize, the broad scope of Scripture, and God's Spirit for that matter says of this, because you know in your history what it's like to be welcomed to immigrants and hated immigrants, be welcoming. Because you know what it's like to be lost in sin and forgiven of sin, be forgiving. Because God loves you, love others, all the others. And it's anchored broadly in the stories that come out of the time the people of God spent in Egypt. So what does that mean for us in Wayne County, Ohio, USA 2021? What does it mean as we walk with people learning from each other as we think about our love step prayer? What does it mean as we consider political arguments and controversies and how this all relates to the governments around us? Right? We've been talking about postures of the people of God, of people like us. But then there's another step to take to say, well, what does that mean as we think of governments? What does this mean, thinking of the next step, what does this mean as we consider immigration injustice? racial injustice, hunger, poverty? What does this mean as you consider neighbors where you live? Or what does this mean as we consider our neighbors, our collective neighbors, uh, because of where our center, our church building lies, uh, in French Village and in the area surrounding us here? How do we take because we know in our history what it's like to be welcomed and hated, be welcoming. How do we take, because we know what it's like to be lost in sin and forgiven of sin, to be forgiving, what, is it, what does it look like as we think of God loving us and our imperative to love others, all the others? What does it look like in our interactions tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon? Let's pray. God, we're grateful to be together.
in our homes and in our worship space in our building and wherever we are joining. We're grateful for your spirit working in us, joining us in community. We're grateful to look at your word, to hear it, to consider what it means. We're grateful that we're not left alone as we think about applying what we've learned. We have each other and we have your spirit. And so God, I pray that you would give us space and energy and place to work at understanding this together. Discerning your call and your spirit. We trust you, God, to help us each check our own postures toward others. And we pray for wisdom. And we pray for mercy. We pray for patience. We trust you, God, and we love you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Okay, let's stand and sing again. Now we're in the blue book, the worship book, number 254, Ah, Holy Jesus. Number 514, Lord, I am fondly, earnestly. Amen. 
Lord, I am fondly, earnestly longing into thy holy likeness to grow, thirsting for more and deeper communion, yearning thy love more fully to know. Open the wells of grace and salvation, pour the rich streams deep into my heart, cleanse and refine my thought and affection, seal me and make me pure as thou art. Dead to the world would I be, O oh Father, dead unto sin, alive unto thee. Crucify all the earthly within me, emptied of sin and self may I be. Open the wells of grace and salvation, pour the rich streams deep into my heart, cleanse and refine my thought and affection, seal me and make me pure as thou art. I would be thine and serve thee forever. Filled with thy spirit, lost in thy love. Come to my heart, Lord, come with anointing. Showers of grace send down from above. Open the wells of grace and salvation. Pour the rich dreams deep into my heart, cleanse and refine my thought and affection, seal me and make me pure as thou art. Amen. Please be seated. All right, Raleigh and Jan will leave, uh, lead us in the responsive love step prayer. <coughs> Lord, open my eyes to see when you introduce me to someone. Help me to greet them, meet them with, with love where they are. Help us to walk together. Help us Help to us learn to together. From each other. That's funny. Help us to share your love with others. Help, Help us to see that, that as, as we, we do, do these things, things we, we are, are growing closer, closer to Christ, Christ. Christ. Yeah. together. Okay, that was that was interesting. We uh, we forgot how to do that in person. <laughs> how to do responses in person? Well, okay. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever. Amen. Okay, this ends the recorded part of the service.